Um, excellent. So welcome everyone to the MGB Neurology Grand Rounds today. My name is John McLaren. I am one of the current uh, Child Neurology Chief Residents here at Massachusetts General Hospital. I, um, we're, we're going to, we have the, the link uh, on the, and the code to claim the CME, CME credit uh, for today's conference right on the, the main screen right there. Um, if you have any questions throughout the lecture today, please direct them to me in the chat or the Q&A portion uh, of your sidebar, and I will read them aloud at the end, time permitting. So it's my distinct honor today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Audrey Brumbach, uh, Assistant Professor of Neurology, Pediatrics, and Neuroscience, uh, the Center for Learning and Memory and Institute for Neuroscience at the Dell Medical School and the College of Natural Sciences at the University of Texas at Austin. Dr. Brumbach earned her MD and PhDs, uh, PhD degrees at the University of Colorado under the mentorship of our current chair, uh, Dr. Kevin Staley. In her PhD work, she discovered a thermodynamic mechanism that determines the directionality of current through the GABA-A receptor in neuron, uh, neonatal neurons. She trained in the neuroscience pathway in the child neurology residency at the University of California, San Francisco, followed by postdoctoral training with uh, Dr. Vikas Sohal. In her postdoctoral work, she discovered in mice that uh, different genetic and environmental causes of autism lead to a similar change in prefrontal neuronal physiology and that the affected neurons are required for typical social behavior. Her professional interests are focused on helping people with autism and related neurodevelopmental conditions thrive. Clinically, Dr. Brumbach diagnoses and cares for people of all ages with developmental brain conditions with a special focus on autism. Her research program is aimed at understanding how genetic and epigenetic changes associated with autism change the physiology of thalamocortical brain circuits. Her long-term goal is to develop neuromod neuromodulation therapies for specific neuropsychiatric symptoms that localize to the prefrontal network. From my brief conversations with her and others that know her well, uh, she's equal parts kind and brilliant and making significant inroads toward a better understanding of the developing brain. So without further uh, ado, Dr. Brumbach, the floor is yours. Aww. Thanks, Dr. McLaren. What a fantastic introduction. Thank you. So um, the topic for today is autism for the neurologist. So I remember when I emerged from child neurology residency, I had, uh, you know, I was very good at managing ICU patients, uh, but I had more challenge with uh, managing behavioral neurology issues. And so part of what I want to accomplish today is to help um, help. Uh, all the neurologists in the audience feel more comfortable with this, uh, with the diagnosis of autism. And then we'll spend time uh, talking about some basic research that I'm doing in my, uh, in my laboratory. So I'm not going to uh, discuss any non-approved uses of drugs, and I don't have any conflicts of interest. So uh, I have been very lucky to be uh, shepherded along this path uh, that I've been on by fantastic mentors um, uh, throughout my life and by uh, fantastic funding mechanisms that are geared towards keeping physician scientists uh, on this path. And so uh, starting with uh, being at the University of Texas for my undergraduate degree, and then circling back to, uh, to be a professor, it's been really rewarding. So uh, I have the best team. Uh, we uh, have a, a great group. It's uh, me and uh, my husband, Mackenzie Howard. We uh, have a commingled uh, ecosystem uh, for uh, understanding uh, the brain as it relates to autism and epilepsy. The work I'm gonna tell you about today was done primarily by uh, Polina Luboslavsky, Alona Kizimenko, and Catherine Haberl in my lab. I wanna take the opportunity to uh, highlight a program that I'm involved with called Women in Neuroscience. The idea is that talent is not gendered and opportunity shouldn't be either. And so the, uh, the goal of the program is to empower a diverse community of female students to pursue leadership careers in neuroscience and neurology. And while this organization was founded in Austin, Texas, uh, we are hoping to expand to a, uh, a medical school and university near you. I want to highlight uh, four of the women that I've started mentoring this year, uh, Samantha Jackson, 
uh, is graduating and is applying for neuroscience PhD programs right now. Uh, Marisa Marquez, uh, Emmanuel Bassi, and Zora Cook uh, will be applying for MD PhD programs to get PhDs in neuroscience and become child neurologists. So keep uh, an eye out for these fantastic future leaders in the pediatric neurosciences. So learning objectives for today. Uh, I want people to be able to walk away from uh, today's session, being able to name some subtle presentations of the core symptoms of autism. I want you to be able to define what masking or camouflaging is and how it can cause uh, challenges for women to uh, be diagnosed with autism. And then to name some brain circuits being studied for their involvement in autism. So we'll start by uh, answering the question, is there really an increasing prevalence uh, of autism in our society? Then we'll talk about some subtle signs of autism and barriers to the diagnosis of autism for women. I'm gonna uh, implore you to uh, press the pause button uh, when you're interacting with people who have, say, dual diagnoses of ADHD and anxiety and to ask yourself, could this person have undiagnosed autism? We'll talk about the thalamus as it relates to brain-wide networks and in particularly the prefrontal cortex. And I'll tell you about the work that we're doing in my lab to study the cognitive thalamus uh, with regard to its structure and function and how that is changed by environmental and genetic causes of autism. So, how common is autism? Well, the numbers, as you I'm sure are all aware, have been uh, increasing steadily um, for the past um, couple of decades. And the big question on everybody's mind is, is there really an increase in autism prevalence? Well, <laughs> the answer I think is no. So I think that this uh, graph really nicely demonstrates what the bulk of the literature is telling us, which is that it's not that autism as a biological entity is emerging within our population. It's that the way that we diagnose developmental brain conditions is changing. And the words that we use to describe people with certain um, symptoms and signs is changing. So in this uh, really lovely work um, by Audrey Thurman colleagues, uh, looking at the numbers of students uh, with uh, autism classifications versus intellectual disability classifications for uh, school, we find that there's an inverse relationship between intellectual disability and autism. And we think that this accounts for the vast majority of that perceived increase in autism in the community. It's possible to diagnose autism as early as 18 months of age. However, most people aren't diagnosed until after the age of four. And then there are many autistic people who are flying under the radar until later in life. And so I'd like to talk about why. And what are the things that we can be on the lookout for that could help us identify people who currently are being underdiagnosed? When it comes to the core symptoms of autism, I think many of us have a stereotypical idea of what a person with autism looks like. What I'd like to go through now is what are some subtle versions of those core symptoms of autism? that uh, meet diagnostic criteria based on the DSM-5, um, but may not be picked up as autistic symptoms. These subtle autistic symptoms that we're gonna talk about are very common in females and therefore go unrecognized because they are so subtle. So starting with uh, social uh, communication, so social emotional reciprocity. Many of us think of a person who lacks empathy and is disengaged um, from others. In reality, this can be a person where it's, hard, it's just hard for them to engage in small talk. Uh, it's hard for them to share their feelings. It can be easier for people to engage in that desired social interactions 
when there's an activity that they can do. So like board games. Um, I know that my brother played a lot of Dungeons and Dragons growing up with his friends. It's a, it's a way to, um, to coexist with other people in a social environment without that need for the constant back and forth uh, conversation. Nonverbal communication. We think of somebody who doesn't make eye contact. They have a flat affect. And kids who aren't pointing to, um, to get the things they need or to direct uh, people's attention to things that they think are cool. Well, this can be subtle, these nonverbal communication differences. So it can be not that you don't make eye contact, but that it's uncomfortable. A person can have difficulty telling if somebody's being sarcastic or based on subtle facial expressions, how they're feeling. A person can have trouble understanding the difference between lighthearted ribbing and mean-spirited um, teasing or have a hard time telling the difference between joking, teasing, and bullying. A person can have um, unusual prosody, so it doesn't have to be completely flat, but rather it can be more nasal or more sing-songy or more robotic sounding, or a lack of volume control where regardless of what situation you're in, the volume is the same. And then as to the kids who aren't pointing, I have many of uh, uh, kids in my practice um, who do point. It's just they only do it to get things that they want. They aren't doing it purely to express um, uh, uh, a social desire to interact with another person and share an experience. In terms of developing and maintaining pure relationships, the key here is we're talking about peer relationships. We often think about a person having no friends and doesn't want friends. So the person with, with subtle autism can have lots of friends. It's just that they may gravitate towards older or younger kids. Often they like to play a defined role. So as a, the teacher or as the helper, Sometimes they can be described as bossy because the, when playing with, with uh, others, they need to be the ones uh, running the show. And then you can see people who have autism who have friend groups, but it's more likely that those friends are people that they've known forever, cousins, you know, friends from early childhood. In terms of stereotypies, we think of a person as having echolalia, repeating phrases and words back um, on block, body rocking, spinning, hand flapping, lining up objects. Subtle versions of this can be somebody who has a real eye for detail, a um, person who's highly organized, a person who reads the same book or watches the same movie over and over. And the physical manifestations of stereotypies can be as simple as picking cuticles repeatedly. Of note, girls don't tend to have as many stereotyped behaviors as boys in general. And the ones that they do have can be more subtle, like the ones we just talked about. In terms of cognitive inflexibility, we often think of somebody who has a strict adherence to routines, cannot tolerate change, and maybe has odd rituals. This can manifest as somebody who it tends towards perfectionism and tolerates changes in routine or transitions, but it makes them very anxious. These are kids that can be beloved by the school, by the teachers and their parents because they're strict rule followers and um, would never do something without permission first. And then finally, uh, interests and sensory differences. So a stereotypical presentation of an of a, um, of a, a unusually uh, strong interest would be something odd, like memorizing the train schedule of the Paris Metro, despite never having visited Europe. In subtle, more, in more subtle presentations of autism and in women, those interests can be things that are socially acceptable. 
like a girl who's really into horses or a girl who's really into princesses or pop stars. And so those uh, restricted interests don't end up being flagged as an autism symptom because they are, um, they're not odd. And then in terms of sensory differences, we often think of a person who's, you know, the child who's uh, spinning the wheels on the toy car or watching a fan spin, um, a child who doesn't want to be touched. When in reality, sensory differences in autism can manifest in many different ways. One is a high pain threshold. So this is the child who skins their knee and just keeps on running as if nothing happened. Um, this can be differences in, in how we perceive temperature. So this is the person who is wearing shorts year round in Boston. Um, many people with autism really enjoy lining things up visually. So they're not physically manipulating things to to observe them in particular um, configurations, but rather they're moving their themselves so that they can position the objects uh, so that they're uh, nicely aligned. We see uh, picky eating, um, especially around textures. And then uh, sensory seeking behaviors, like a person who explores the world through their fingertips, who loves um, feeling textures, so we've just discussed how these core autism symptoms can present both in a stereotypical way, but also in a more subtle way, and that those subtle presentations of autism are more common in females. So let's talk about um, underdiagnosis of autism in girls. So autism is underdiagnosed in girls despite comparable age at which the parents express their concerns, comparable symptom severity, the number of appointments they have with healthcare professionals, and the duration of those assessments. So we talked um, about these different and subtle signs and symptoms of autism. Next, let's talk about masking or camouflaging. So for women, the signs and symptoms of autism are often about the internal experience. And so many women with autism will do what they need to do to blend into the neurotypical society. They know they're supposed to make eye contact. They know they're supposed to make small talk. And so they find mechanisms, they find coping strategies to engage in these behaviors that they understand or really required to, to be part of neurotypical society. And so I, I had a patient just two weeks ago where I uh, asked mom and the teenage daughter the same questions at the same time. And I said, you know, I'm curious to know what both of you think about each of these issues. And categorically, the mom answered no <laughs> to every question I asked about eye contact and small talk and relationships. And at every, every time I asked a question, mom would answer no. And then the teen, when mom was done talking, she'd say, it's interesting you say that because actually, and then she would spend five minutes talking about how challenging it is to make eye contact and how it's something she's always known she's had to do. And so she does it. And so really, in order to diagnose autism in women, it often takes asking them about what it feels like um, to engage in these neurotypical behaviors. One way that um, uh, girls with autism um, end up sort of declaring themselves as having autism is that they do this masking, this camouflaging all day at school. And so the teachers don't see any, any issues kid looks like she's blending in fine. Um, but then after all that time at, at school of exerting all of that cognitive energy to blend in, the child melts down at home after school. And so that's a common thing that we hear is that child seems fine at school and then at home is just a, a, a wreck. So we've talked about different subtle, different and subtle symptoms and signs and masking and camouflaging. 
Now I'd like to talk about how women engage in fewer what we can call red flag behaviors. So you have your person with autism symptoms and many times there are associated symptoms. ADHD, aggression, motor stereotypes, uh, limited expressive language, decreased social engagement. Some of these are autism symptoms, but the idea that um, these are externally visible behaviors that flag a person as having difficulty with their nervous system and then triggers them to be evaluated by a professional. Girls don't tend to have these symptoms. And so because of that, their autism symptoms go unrecognized and this person flies under the radar. If, they, if a person does have these symptoms, then maybe the autism is diagnosed. More frequently, especially in girls, is that this, those red flag symptoms are diagnosed as ADHD, anxiety, depression, language delay. The person might be labeled as odd, quirky, a late bloomer. But that autism diagnosis is not made, the autism component is not recognized. And so you have these people going through life, not understanding why everything is so hard. And then hopefully they later in life finally have it recognized that many of the challenges that they've had throughout their life stems from being autistic. So Next, let's review some more of these subtle and different signs and symptoms, and also talk about societal gender roles and how they contribute to how autistic behaviors are interpreted. So barriers to diagnosis in women, the first is that those signs and symptoms are different. There are fewer observable behaviors like motor stereotypies. Girls are able to engage in what we call social echolalia, where they can uh, mimic socially adept peers and therefore mask their, uh, their, their self, themselves. Social difficulties may become more pronounced with age. They may not be apparent early in life. Often autism isn't identified until the social demands really outstrip those compensatory strategies, those masking and camouflaging strategies that the person's been employing. This often happens in middle school and in high school when the whole social landscape changes and, um, and it's just a, it's a more demanding environment socially. Autism is considered a boy's disorder. And so even when girls display autistic symptoms, they're not recognized as being autistic. Parents might you know, recognize that their child is having some autism symptoms. And so they go and look up autism on the internet, but they find that basically all of the information is about males. And so they think, well, I guess this can't be autism because <laughs> my daughter, uh, isn't male. I think that the, the last part here is that autism is considered a, boy, a boy's diagnosis. It lands on our shoulders as medical professionals. We as medical professionals are hesitant to give the diagnosis to girls. So my uh, charge to you is when you see a person um, in your clinic, I'm talking to the adult neurologist, the child neurologist, and everybody in between. If you see a woman who carries diagnoses, dual diagnoses of anxiety or social anxiety and ADHD, I want you to press the pause button and think, could this person have undiagnosed autism? Even if this isn't why they're coming to see you, because it may be contributing to their overall state of being. And if you can help recognize that and even if you don't do the evaluation yourself, but get them plugged into people who can, that could be life-changing for this person. If you are taking care of patients who are in their preteen years or teenage years who are having major meltdowns at home, think about autism. 
I often have the chief complaint of school trouble for my neurology clinic. And I find that a large number of those people have autism. And when it comes to adults, um, press the pause button. If you have somebody with a personality disorder, ask, could this be undiagnosed autism? And remember that the diagnosis might have been missed earlier in life, even by skilled clinicians. It doesn't matter how many doctors the person is seen or uh, the amount, the types or the amounts of, of uh, uh, evaluations they've had, autism is still underdiagnosed in girls. Okay, so let's switch gears and I'm gonna transition to talking about the biology of autism. So, uh, you know, the, the other major question besides is autism increasing in prevalence is what causes autism? And so uh, the, the short answer is genes. So uh, genetic changes cause most cases of autism. This is of course an entire seminar unto itself, um, but I, I will uh, have you walk away with the understanding that we now have over a hundred genes that have been identified that when mutated, lead to a very high probability of having autism. And so uh, one of these genes, FMR1, is the uh, gene that's mutated in Fragile X syndrome. I'll tell you um, a little bit later about some work I'm doing in mice that model Fragile X. The other major uh, contributor to autism is prenatal exposures. And I'll just highlight one here, um, which is important for neurologists, which is that prenatal exposure to valproic acid leads to a markedly increased risk of autism in the offspring. And so uh, this actually led to valproic acid being banned in Europe as a first line uh, medication. And so, uh, you know, it's clearly a very widely used drug. It's great for many things, not only epilepsy, but for uh, mood stabilization. And so uh, we think that the reason that valproic acid uh, leads to differences in, in uh, brain function in the, um, in the offspring is, is, it, is its histone deacetylase inhibitor properties that induce epigenetic changes in the fetus so that uh, genes are being expressed that wouldn't normally be expressed, and that leads to differences in brain function. These different genetic and environmental exposures uh, are modeled in uh, mice and chicks and rats and zebrafish and monkeys. And uh, in my laboratory, we use uh, mice primarily and I'll tell you about some work that we're doing using uh, the mice that model in utero exposure to valproic acid and the fragile X syndrome. So there, you know, we just talked about how there are scores of genetic changes that can cause um, autism. And the genes that are implicated really, you know, it runs the gamut from cell adhesion molecules to ion channels and everything in between. So the focus of my work is to really understand how this diverse array of genetic and epigenetic changes leads to uh, specific behavioral phenotypes. And so one way to conceptualize how these diverse genetic etiologies lead to a convergent behavioral disorder is that they cause abnormal activity in specific brain circuits. And so we're really talking about localizing um, neurologists bread and butter. And my hope is that if we can localize specific behaviors to distinct cell types within certain brain regions, then we can direct our therapies to those circuits to alleviate symptoms. And that circuit-based therapy will allow us to treat those behavioral symptoms regardless of what that underlying genetic etiology is. So 
how do we get there from here? Well, it really comes down to localizing, just like we do in neurology, the symptoms uh, of autism to specific brain circuits. So how do you do that in autism? Well, it's challenging. Autism symptoms and all of the behavioral, all the processes that are involved in autism are complex and are distributed throughout the brain and require the coordination of multiple brain areas. And so how do you localize that? Well, the focus of my work is on the core of the brain, the center of the brain, the inner chamber of the brain uh, known as the thalamus. So the thalami is this paired uh, bilateral structure with these egg-shaped egg um, uh, nuclei in the center of the brain. And the thalamus connects with essentially the whole brain. <laughs> so what I'm showing you here is tractography of uh, connections between the thalamus and the cortex. The thalamus also has rich uh, connections with subcortical structures including uh, the, the cerebellum. So in medical school, we learn that the thalamus is this relay station. It takes in sensory inputs and it sends them on to the cortex, which is really where the business, where the business end of the brain. So we're starting to understand though that the thalamus is more than a relay station. It's really performing calculations on this information and processing it as it uh, then uh, communicates with downstream brain regions. The part of the thalamus that I study is part of the cognitive thalamus, where the main inputs from, uh, the main inputs that drive the uh, activity of these cells come not from the periphery, not from sensory organs, but rather from the cortex itself. So, I study the medial dorsal thalamus, which is I'll refer to as MD throughout this talk, uh, which connects reciprocally with prefrontal cortex. So prefrontal cortex was actually first defined as the cortex that received inputs from MD. Uh, MD is required for various uh, uh, cognitive um, tasks learning and memory, cognitive flexibility, corollary discharge uh, to guide eye movements and our ability to understand that when we move our, uh, when we saccade, the movement that we see in the world is not from the world moving, but rather from our eyes moving. In autism, uh, medial dorsal thalamus has been uh, found to have decreased volume and also decreased structural and functional connectivity with the prefrontal cortex. So for the remainder of the talk, we'll be going through um, the experiments that we do in my lab to map the circuits in this part of the thalamus, in this cognitive thalamus, the MD thalamus. So what I'll show you is evidence that uh, this reciprocal interaction between MD and the prefrontal cortex is required for social exploration behavior in mice. I'll then show you experiments where we record the electrical activity of these cells in uh, brain slice preparations, and we find that the MD is not a homogeneous population that the two regions of MD that project to the prefrontal cortex the neurons in each of these regions have distinct physiology and distinct morphology when we trace their beautiful uh, dendritic arbors. So first we'll talk about the behavioral studies I do where I test if these particular populations of neurons are required for social behavior. The approach that we take is called optogenetics. It's a form of neuromodulation where we use light sensitive ion channels to either activate or inhibit specific populations of neurons. So seen here is my terrible drawing of a group of neurons. Um, and if we were to stimulate this electrically, the whole field of neurons would receive um, the energy. In the case of optogenetics, we can selectively target 
and this light sensitive ion channel to a subpopulation of those neurons so that only those neurons receive the energy. And so by shining uh, different colors of light, we can uh, open these light sensitive ion channels and gate either positive or negative ions to cause the cell to depolarize and fire action potentials or to hyperpolarize and become less excitatory. So I'll walk you through a typical experiment. Um, I'm showing you here a sagittal section of the mouse brain with the accompanying mouse in the upper left corner. And I'm showing you this reciprocal connection between prefrontal cortex and MD. So the first step is to inject this virus that encodes the light sensitive ion channel into one of those two uh, brain regions. Then we implant an optical fiber in the opposite brain region. That allows us to shine light only on the uh, axon terminals of the uh, neurons that are expressing that light sensitive ion channel. This allows us to selectively activate only, say, the MD neurons that are projecting to prefrontal cortex, as opposed to if we put our, um, our light fiber in MD, we would be activating all MD neurons. Here, we're, we're selectively targeting just the neurons that in MD that project to prefrontal cortex. So the implanted animal then uh, engages in different behavioral assays and we quantify autism relevant behaviors. And we are able to test the necessity of these populations of neurons by shining light and selectively activating or inhibiting these uh, populations of neurons. And so each animal is its own control. Uh, each animal does the task twice, once without light and once with light, and they're randomized to which one they get first. And here are how we, uh, how we display the data. So we have our, on our y-axis for this particular assay, it's the amount of time that the animal sniffs the other mouse. And we do this both when the light is off and when the light is on, the light on being shown by that blue bar. In the trial in which the animal um, did not receive light, this animal sniffed for uh, 150 uh, seconds out of the five minute trial. And in the trial when the light was on, the animal sniffed for 100 seconds. So we can say that uh, in the presence of the photo photostimulation, there was a decrease in social exploration activity. So I'll show you now um, the results of the experiment that I walked you through here, where we stimulate the uh, MD to PFC, uh, that thalamocortical circuit. And I'll also show you the opposite experiment where we stimulate the corticothalamic arm of that network. So the types of assays that we do uh, are uh, really related to uh, autism and uh, learning and memory. I'm showing you some of them here. We um, uh, engage in uh, these uh, assays in a, in a stereotyped fashion so that every mouse gets uh, the same treatments. So, the graph I'm showing you here is illustrating the results of an experiment in which we stimulated the thalamocortical arm of the prefrontal network. We see that in the uh, light off condition, the animal, each animal is a single dot and the um, uh, aggregate data are shown um, with the mean and standard error that uh, the animal, the animals engaged in a certain amount of sniffing behavior when the light was off. And then on the trials when the light was on, there was a strong decrease in the amount of time they spent engaged in social behavior. I'll just show you one of those other studies uh, of those other behavioral assays that we did here. It is um, basically the same assay, only instead of a, uh, the mouse being the stimulus, it's, a, um, it's an object. Uh, this is a way to test for interest in general novelty. Uh, we did not see uh, a change in uh, uh, exploration of novel objects, 
nor do we see a change in locomotion, anxiety-like behavior um, measured through avoidance of the center of the open field, um, or olfactory behavior in any of these experiments, really remarkably. So here I'm showing you the other uh, uh, angle. So this is the corticothalamic loop where we are um, taking the neurons that uh, live in the prefrontal cortex and we're stimulating their terminals in MD. We see the same thing where the light on trials, we have a decrease in time spent sniffing without a change in the object exploration. In uh, valproic acid exposed mice, um, we see these same results when we uh, activate these neurons uh, in valproic acid mice. They also show a decrease in their time spent uh, engaged in social behavior. Uh, what's particularly interesting is that when we inhibit these cells, we're seeing an increase in their social exploration time without an accompanying change in any of the other behaviors. So what I'm showing you is that in mice, uh, this prefrontal thalamocortical and corticothalamic loop is required for typical social exploration. Next, I'm going to tell you about how we measure the physiology of these neurons. So we make brain slices from uh, the, the mice, and we use retrograde tracers to selectively target particular populations of neurons. In this case, neurons in the medial dorsal thalamus that project to the prefrontal cortex. And here we're testing the hypothesis that these different populations of neurons have different functions. So here we are, we're injecting our retrograde tracer into the prefrontal cortex that's taken up by these neurons in the uh, medial and lateral parts of the MD thalamus and allows us to selectively record from cells in each one of those regions. So when we measure and compare the beautiful uh, electrophysiology, what we see is this. So here we're giving a neuron a, a series of hyperpolarizing and depolarizing current steps. And you can see there's a lot of rich information here about the neuron's physiology. Um, one of which is, is clear, these beautiful um, action potentials. And one that's less clear, which is this uh, sag, uh, this voltage sag, which is mediated by HCN channels or IH, otherwise known as IF, the funny current, which is responsible for cardiac pacemaking. Uh, this uh, hi this uh, hyperpolarization activated uh, channel is present in these neurons and is responsible for their uh, physiology. And what I'll show you next is that that is different between the medial and the lateral parts of this nucleus. So I'll show you that the physiological properties of the neurons in this, in this nucleus depends on whether you're in the medial or the lateral part. I'll show you that the lateral neurons have shorter time constants, lower resistance, and more HCN channel activity. And then I'll show you that loss of the fragile X gene um, changes the intrinsic excitability of the lateral neurons. So first, lateral MD neurons have faster membrane time constants. So here we're giving this neuron a hyperpolarizing current pulse and measuring the voltage response. And we see that uh, very clearly that medial cells for the same amount of current are having a much larger voltage response. V equals IR for the same amount of I, we're getting a larger V. And so that means that the resistance is increased compared to the lateral cells. This is accompanied by um, a slower membrane time constant um, in the medial cells. Resistance is a major contributor to the membrane time constant. So this means that these lateral neurons have a shorter integration time window. They're gonna be less uh, able to uh, integrate uh, inputs that are not closely timed. This low resistance in the lateral cells um, is associated with an increase in that voltage sag, that HCN channel activity. 
And the membrane resistance of all of these neurons is directly related to the amount of voltage sag or HCN activity that these cells have. So we can test uh, directly if these cells have higher HCN channel activity by recording the HCN currents. Um, we can also use pharmacology to block the channels. And what we find is that when we provide this drug called ZD7288, which blocks these channels, we see that this voltage sag, this measurement of HCN channel activity goes away. Um, we see very clearly that in the medial cells, there's just less baseline voltage sag activity than there is in the lateral cells. And then when we provide this drug that decreases um, the HCN channel activity, we see that the lateral neurons really become more like uh, medial cells in terms of their membrane resistance. And so this uh, really implies that the HCN channel activity is higher in these lateral cells and that it's a major contributor to the decreased membrane resistance. Because they have leakier membranes, they require, the lateral cells require more current to get them to fire. Here I'm showing the number of action potentials as a function of the current we're giving the cell. And in fragile X mice, when we measure the amount of current it takes to get the cells to fire action potentials, we see that in the lateral um, part of this nucleus, the knockout animals um, have an easier time firing action potentials than the wild types. So what I'm showing you um, is that the electrophysical, electrophysiological properties are really depending on whether you're in one part of this nucleus or the other. And that this changes, um, the properties of these neurons change uh, in autism models. So we can fill these cells with a, um, a substance called biocytin that allows us to visualize the dendritic morphology of these cells. And we can trace their dendritic arbors. What we find is that medial cells are more complex than lateral cells. So we can quantify how complex a cell is by drawing concentric circles that emanate from its cell body and then measuring the amount of dendrite that's in each one of those concentric circles. And so this is called Scholl analysis. And we see that the medial cells have greater um, uh, amount of dendrite uh, in each of those circles further away from the soma. And when we calculate a complexity index, which takes into account the number of dendrites, the uh, total volume of the cell, and how many branches each dendrite has, we see that the medial cells are more complex than lateral. Interestingly, in the fragile X syndrome model mice, we're finding that the lateral cells are more complex and the medial cells are less complex. So this is really exciting because most of the changes that have been observed in fragile X mice um, are at the level of dendritic spines. And so it's pretty rare to find that there's this gross morphological difference um, caused by loss of the fragile X gene. So what I've shown you is our work mapping the cognitive thalamus and how the uh, connection between MD and PFC is required for social exploration, how the physiology of these neurons uh, within this nucleus is different depending on where the cells reside. And the morphology is also different. And that in the fragile X model, um, all of these uh, 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 physiological and morphological features are affected. So the grant that I have from the NIMH right now is to ask the question, what about behavior? Um, I'm testing a model that the uh, medial and lateral parts of this nucleus are uh, responsible for different part, different types of behavior. And so that gets us back to our overall goal, which is to um, use neuromodulation strategies at the level of circuits to treat specific symptoms. And by understanding the physiology of these neurons and how they um, how, how we can divide them into different populations, it allow, it's going to allow us to get really specific in terms of the, the 
way that we treat symptoms by having the most uh, precise uh, targeting for our, for our treatments to have the off-target effects. So um, I'd like to end there and take questions. Uh, it started uh, with my daughter Ruby and her Baby's First Neuroscience book and how it's going. Those are my uh, Ruby and Opal fighting over our brain uh, mold. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Brumbeck. Um, that was wonderful. We can now open up questions uh, to the audience. It sounds like we've got at least one question here from Dr. Staley. So uh, he says, Audrey, beautiful and eye-opening talk. Uh, given the substantial number of excellent genetic causes of autism and infectious uh, in, in IAD, uh, for example, FMR1, to what degree does male X chromosome hemizygosity contribute to male-female differences in autism? And then, Andrew, is there gender effects in the animal models? Yeah. So um, two closely related questions. So um, the uh, so I guess uh, sort of at a uh, when I think about um, so, for instance, like fragile X mice, when you have uh, the males, which are XY, and they have that single mutation um, on that X chromosome. They don't have another X chromosome to, uh, to compensate. The females who have both copies deleted are similar to the knockout males. Um, and the heterozygotes are, don't really have much of a phenotype. Um, and so I think that, you know, in general, um, the male hemizygosity plus um, the, um, the uh, uh, mosaicism that takes place with uh, X inactivation um, makes it really complex. Um, and I think that what we're seeing, especially in Rett syndrome, which is uh, an X-linked um, dominant disorder, uh, is that depending on which uh, uh, mosaic uh, uh, X inactivation pattern you have in your brain uh, contributes to the symptoms that you have. And then uh, Dr. Zimmerman asks, there's gender effect in the animal models. Um, so for the uh, fragile X experiments, we have primarily done those experiments in males. Um, for the valproic acid experiments, we have not observed a gender effect, um, but we have not really been powered to really uh, to, to, to measure that uh, specifically. Dr. Zimmerman also asks, are their standard assessments for ASD in children less effective in girls? Well, I'd love to talk to you about this. <laughs> so um, my understanding is that the autism evaluation tools that we have really been developed based on symptoms in boys. Um, so many of those more subtle um, presentations of autism that um, we find in girls, you know, a girl isn't necessarily going to reach uh, the cutoff score for stereotypies because that's not uh, how girls present. Um, I do think that there's also, uh, you know, a lot as standardized as these assessments are, there's, there is a lot of subjectivity to how they are interpreted. Um, and even though a person um, is scoring the same behaviors, um, they may not, uh, they, you know, a person who's, who's performing these evaluations might not, you know, ask the follow-up question um, in the standardized interview about something that uh, is a, a typically, you know, female trait. Um, they might gloss over that and move on. So, uh, yeah, but I would love to sit down and have a conversation with you about this. I have a question for you. So what is the typical spiel that you give to a parent that asks, what is happening to my child from a neurologic perspective at the level of the brain? Um, why is my child so different? Yeah, so, and, and then, you know, how can I make them less how they are? So the spiel that I give is the following. <laughs> 
uh, I use the analogy of handedness. So I tell families that some people's brains are wired up differently than other people's. And it used to be that people who were left-handed uh, had their hand, left, left hand tied down. Um, so they would learn to write with their correct hand. And we look at that now as being barbaric and why would you ever try to change somebody so that they would write with another hand? And, you know, and I think that we're enlightened now and we realize that just because somebody's, uh, the way somebody's brain operates is not in the majority does not make it wrong. We understand that people who are left-handed, their brains are wired up differently, you know, language centers, et cetera. It's, uh, it's, you know, there's clearly a difference in wiring there and in function. And that's largely how I see autism is that this is just your child's brain is wired up differently and it's not right or wrong, it's just different. And the issue is that they're living in a neurotypical society. We call it neurotypical because the people who aren't autistic are the majority. And so for left-handed people, you know, they have a harder time with cutting, with driving stick shift. You know, there are accommodations that we provide to people who are left-handed to live in this right-handed world. And similarly, there are accommodations uh, for people with autism so that they can thrive in this non-autistic world. That's really wonderful, thank you. Um, uh, Yeni uh, Lenoila Lin has written, the medications that you mentioned as predisposing to autism with in utero exposure were all AEDs, uh, from what I could see. Is this just because of the population of mothers studied, presumably those with seizures, or is there something about the medication class association that might tell you something about causality? Oh, let's see here. Um, so I'm just reading through your question. Um, so yeah, so uh, so these uh, in this in that particular study it was um, uh, they did pull out women that were uh, that had were taking those medicines because of epilepsy. Um, it when you control for uh, whether the person is taking medicine because of epilepsy or be, for other reasons, we still see the association with valproic acid, um, and so uh, you know. And this this really influences how we counsel, uh, you know, families that, you know, the most important thing is to get your seizures under control uh, while you're pregnant. And we're going to use the medicines that are required to do that. We're going to opt for medicines that don't have these associations. Um, but you know, in many parts of the world, we use them. It doesn't mean that any one child is going to be autistic because they were exposed to valproic acid in utero. It's more on a population level that. Um, that we see this increase. So it's it's much harder when it comes to counseling the individual patient sitting in front of you. Uh, Dr. Staley's also uh, written, may have missed this. Do you think that the differences in H current are due to changes in the amounts of dendrites or do you think that there's a difference in channel density? Yeah, so um, that is part, that's, uh, aim to <laughs> is to measure the, uh, the H currents in these cells. Um, I think it's going to be hard because uh, a lot of it does, uh, a lot of the H current does reside on the dendrites and we're going to be patching at the soma. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, we're going to get creative and trying to figure out how we're going to uh, decide whether it's um, function on the individual channel level or channel density, or if it's, uh, you know, differences in, in the, which H channels, different subunits um, that are present. And the last question uh, from Dr. Zimmerman is, do you foresee neurophysiological tests or neuroimaging that may become helpful in uh, future ASD assessments? I think so. I think that, um, you know, we right now we have no really we don't have any biological measures there's a lot of active areas of research and um for biomarkers um, looking at eye tracking and physio different um you know skin physiological measurements heart rate measurements um and i think that that is going to 
you know, once we get <laughs> those figured out, I think it's going to be really helpful. And I think that it's going to be probably most helpful when it comes to triaging the kids that need further evaluation, kids that aren't the waiting room diagnosis that the, um, the pediatrician doesn't necessarily feel comfortable giving the diagnosis to, um, but this would sort of tip their, uh, their decision making towards, oh yeah, let's get this kid over to see neurology sooner rather than later versus, you know, watchful waiting. Um, I also think that these physiological assessments are going to be useful in terms of understanding where in the brain uh, the symptoms are arising. You know, each person has their own constellation of strengths and challenges, and the ones that are particularly problematic for one person are going to be different for another person. And my hope is that if we can identify where each of those different symptoms lives in the brain, um, and we can identify a way to, uh, you know, measure that physiologically, uh, then I will have a person who comes to me in my clinic and I will be able to say, you have this thing called autism. Uh, it's characterized by uh, prefrontal corticothalamic uh, hyperexcitability. And here's the baseball cap that you can wear overnight to stimulate that part of your brain and, um, you know, make those, uh, make that part of the brain function uh, in a better, in a way that's going to better serve you. I think that's it. Thank you so much. Really. That was really wonderful. Thanks, Dr. McLaren. Thanks, everybody. It was really fun. Of course. Have a great afternoon.